Thank you very much, Andrea, for introducing me here. You're right. This is the first time I attend this kind of, of events. But today's events uh, comes at a very important juncture. Um, Saturday, we'll be celebrating, this coming Saturday, we will be celebrating 30 years of Italian connection to the Internet. So, so uh, this is the first of a series of events that eventually will be, will be uh, concluded on Saturday. So I'm particularly pleased that uh, Washington is on the forefront. Uh, 30 years ago, uh, Italy became one of the very first European countries to be connected to the Internet. Uh, the world was different uh, at the time. Uh, this has particular meaning to me because 30 years ago it was exactly when I started the diplomatic life. So uh, I started my, my activity in the foreign service 30 years ago. Uh, so when, when uh, um, we uh, thought about organizing this event as part of our digital diplomacy series, my first uh, uh, thought went to how the world was different and how uh, my own job was different. Uh, this had uh, opportunities, challenges, but uh, uh, thinking about uh, events, uh, one thing came to my mind today. Uh, tomorrow, uh, uh, we will be celebrating 30 years of the Chernobyl uh, accident uh, uh, in Ukraine. Um, one, of, one of my many visits to, to Ukraine because of my job, I once visited, I once visited the museum that, that exposed many, many pictures, photos and reminders of the time. Uh, one of the pictures that is stuck in my mind is of a very, very young boys and girls marching on May the 1st on Labor Day in Kiev. They knew nothing about Chernobyl accident uh, because internet was, was not there at the time. And because they were marching the streets, they still have on their, on their uh, bodies, on their skins, the signs of the radiation to which they were exposed. So uh, this is telling how internet has changed our world, how the information now is spreading. I think that here in the, at the embassy we have very important members of the, of the media, of the media core, so they perfectly understand what, what I mean about that. Uh, the world was different, of course, at the same time, internet is an opportunity, as a challenge, and it is important that we address those challenges at the same time. Uh, we will be celebrating this journey through time. We'll be reminding this today and tonight uh, here at the embassy how Italy played uh, an important role in uh, developing internet, how Italian scientists, scholars, uh, researchers were part of that, of that endeavor, and they still are considered part of a global endeavor because one of the great features of Internet is that uh, we do consider Internet something that is being given to you, the entire humankind. Everybody can, can profit of that. This is important, and this is important for, for ourselves tonight. Um, to tell this story, to, tell, to, to be part of this journey along these 30 years, we have very important people that have accepted our invitation. First of all, uh, all the audience. So I thank everybody for being here tonight. But if there is someone that uh, to whom I'd like to extend a, a special uh, sign of appreciation is one of the fathers, as it is considered, internet, Vin Cerf. Thank you very much, Vin, for being here uh, tonight with us. Uh, you will be accompanying us through this journey but uh, uh, we will talk about innovation, the future, but uh, we are at the Italian Embassy. So we know what history is, what the past is, and nobody is more and more uh, uh, able to tell us and to actually fit into this picture than Vint Cerf. I had the pleasure of having exchanging a few, few ideas with Vint earlier on in, in my office. And I can tell you that uh, uh, the impression I got is of a true renaissance man. And I say renaissance because, you know, whenever we look at the future, whenever you are ready to innovate, to adventure yourself into the unknown waters of the future, you always bring your past, you always bring your, your history, but also you always bring your love for humankind. Uh, Vint is a man of many talents. Uh, in his bio, I read that now he's chief internet evangelist, 
uh, now he'll tell us what being chief internet evangelist means. But he has many passions connected with Italy, with my own country, a country that he knows very well, together with his very uh, uh, nice spouse that is here today. Thank you for being here today. Uh, but uh, he speaks about culture, uh, about, about wine, about uh, history, so everything which is connected to the internet. Uh, we will have this journey tonight. I'm sure that, uh, that uh, this will be not just interesting, but also entertaining. Uh, and uh, uh, before, before asking Vint to, 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 to uh, come to the floor, I can leave you simply with this on my last remarks. Happy birthday, Internet. Thank you. So, buonasera. buonasera. And, uh, and that's all the Italian you're going to get out of me tonight, I'm afraid. So let me start out again by wishing a happy 30th anniversary to Italy and its connection to the Internet. Um, I want to give you a little bit of historical flavor for uh, what transpired uh, before this important date. Uh, the original um, internet work was preceded by something called the ARPANET, which was an experiment that the Defense Department sponsored in packet switching. And I want you to note the day, 1969, this was quite a long time ago. Guess what? My Italian colleagues were working on this same kind of technology around 1970. So we were working in parallel on the idea of packet switching. And at the point where this system was demonstrated in October of 1972, I was asked to form an international network working group. And some of the Italians, whose names I will mention momentarily, uh, were participant in that international network working group. Uh, we had Italians working at UCLA uh, along with me and my colleagues at, uh, on this part of the network. The UCLA was the first node that was installed in September of 1969. So I, I just want you to, to appreciate that our Italian colleagues were already exploring this space well before the 1986 date. Uh, Bob Kahn and I were honored to receive honorary degrees at PISA in 2006. You know that Latin for this is honoris causa. It means you didn't earn this, but, but we, we accepted it anyway. Uh, and and I, I'm very proud to say I still have all of the, uh, the um, um, sort of uh, academic regalia. There are very few opportunities to wear things like that. Uh, so uh, on Easter, uh, I often dress in, in my most ecclesiastical robes, and this would be a good example of that. Uh, and to, uh, with regard to my title at Google, I actually did not ask for that title. When they asked me what title I wanted, I said Archduke. <laughs> and and uh, Larry and Eric and Sergey went away and they came back and they said, you know, the previous Archduke was Ferdinand and he was assassinated in 1914 and it started World War I, so maybe that's a bad title to have. And they, why don't you be our chief internet evangelist? And I said, okay, I can do that, considering I've been doing that for 30 years. Uh, when I was in Russia lecturing, though, somebody misunderstood chief internet evangelist and asked me if I believed in God. And so in public, you know, one of these things. And so I responded after I thought about it to say, well, I'm geek orthodox. And, <laughs> and, and that, that they seem to understand that. So that's, that's my answer and I'm sticking with it. Uh, I want to show you uh, the way in which uh, the Italians uh, were involved in the internet part of things. By 1977, we had three networks, packet switch networks in operation in the US and in Europe. We had a mobile packet radio system running up and down in the Bayshore Freeway, a great big band with very expensive cubic foot radios. We were experimenting with packetized voice and packetized video. So we were doing mobile radio, packet switch radio, which is what you're carrying in your pocket today, but this was literally almost 40 years ago. Uh, we also had put together a satellite network over the Atlantic that connected the eastern part of the US to the western part of Europe, including a ground station in Fucino, Italy. There were other ground stations in Gunhilly Downs in the UK, uh, in Reisting in Germany, uh, and in Tonham, Sweden, which connected our Norwegian colleagues to the system. So our initial interactions with our uh, Italian colleagues were over this satellite network, which had been installed. The oddly shaped thing that, that stretches around the um, Atlantic satellite net is actually the ARPANET stretching all the way to Europe through an internal satellite link. 
So on this day, we had the Bayshore Freeway van running up and down, radiating packets that went all the way through the ARPANET, all the way to the UK, and then through the packet satellite network, all the way back across the Atlantic uh, to the US, and then all the way across the uh, ARPANET again to Los Angeles. Well, the distance between San Francisco and Los Angeles is 400 miles. The packets went 100,000 miles because they went over two synchronous satellite hops, you know, at, at uh, 36,000 kilometers uh, above the, uh, uh, the Earth and back and forth across the Atlantic twice. And it worked. And I have to tell you, I was leaping up and down. It was here in, in D.C. at the time thinking, it works, it works, as if it couldn't possibly have worked. It's software. It's a miracle when software works. <laughs> it was a very important demonstration because it showed that we could link different kinds of packet switch nets together with a common protocol we call TCP IP. Well, that was just the beginning. Now, of course, this is what the internet looks like. And the reason I show you this picture is that the different colors represent different networks. There are hundreds of thousands of networks all around the world that are operated independently of each other. They have different business models, some for profit, some not for profit, some in government, some are private networks like you have in your homes. Uh, and they all get to choose what hardware they're going to use. They can choose who they connect with and under what terms and conditions. It's a totally distributed system. And the important thing is it works because everyone is using a common set of protocols. And so this importance of commonality cannot be overstated. Now to come back to our early interactions with our colleagues, here you see the top half of a letter that Luciano Lanzini, who was at that time uh, at the Canuche uh, in uh, Pisa, wrote to Bob Kahn confirming uh, interest in Italy, in, in the research world, uh, in participating with us in a satellite network uh, that would link uh, the US to, uh, to Europe. And um, we, had, we had other other friends from Italy at UCLA, like Mario Gela, for example, who was part of, uh, of our team at UCLA at the time. So, um, and here's the, the rest of it. But the point I want to make is that this was much earlier than 1986. So you must appreciate that the Italian interest in this began well before this formal April 30 connection. Uh, the next thing to look at is, uh, this is a slide uh, that was prepared uh, by uh, Luciano, I think, um, that described what the satellite system was and how the interconnection was made uh, in April of 1986. And I have one other uh, example. This was um, from, from my friend uh, Claudio Alocchio uh, at Turin. Uh, who had put up um, a slide, you know, the one how we used to do this with transparent paper and the, and the projector and everything. So this is a copy of his slide, which he put together in 1987, not long after the internet connection was made. And you can see, if, if it's not obvious uh, from just trying to look at this, uh, Gmail, by the way, was his name for email. Of course, we use that name at Google now, many years later, and he hasn't come after us and complained about trans trademark or anything, fortunately. Um, anyway, he was showing people how to connect all the different kinds of email systems that were present at the time. Not all of them were part of the internet. There were many other networks at that time that, uh, you know, they, we have uh, BitNet and DECnet and UUCP and so on. X400 was part of the uh, uh, OSI protocols. So the point I want to make here is that we started in a very mixed environment. See, the internet was not uniform everywhere. It was one of many systems that were present at the time. But ultimately, uh, this network uh, became the standard for the rest of the world. And of course, we all enjoy that connectivity today. Uh, this is just a picture of, of me in uh, Stefano Trumpi's uh, uh, home uh, in Pisa, uh, looking at a variety of books and pictures from, from history. And Stefano uh, has a remarkable um, uh, pedigree with regard to his work. Uh, you can see that uh, that after Luciano uh, Lanzini uh, completed his work, that uh, Stefano picked up uh, as the director of uh, Cunice uh, CNR, the Networking Research Laboratory. Uh, he has been a constant in Internet's story in every dimension, including uh, questions of governance. And so he's been very active in the Internet Society, which Bob and I and others started in 1992 extremely active in ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. And I tell you this 
partly to uh, honor Stefano's work, but also to remind you that Italy has been a part of this story since 1970. Now, just a little bit on the internet. I know we're running uh, a bit uh, late here. Uh, I'm guessing, and that's all I can do about the number of things that are uh, possible on the internet. They may not all be on at the same time, but 10 to 15 billion devices are running those protocols. Uh, some of them you carry around in your pocket. Some of them are at the house uh, because you have a Nest thermostat or you may have laptops and desktops and tablets and so on. And we estimate three to three and a half billion users now. And so I'm guessing that by the end of this decade in 2020, that we will have reached about 80% of the world's population. That's about 5.6 billion people. Now, one thing that I would like you to take away is to understand why the internet has been such a powerful tool, uh, not only for um, applications, but also, frankly, for uh, GDP growth. The most weird thing about the internet is that it was not designed for anything in particular. There was no specific application, unlike the telephone system or the uh, television uh, cable system, internet was designed to do one very simple thing, move little bags of bits from point A to point B with a probability greater than zero. And that's all we asked of the internet layer of protocol is try to deliver these things. It's best efforts communication, like the post office. You know, if you send a postcard, there's no guarantee the postcard comes out the other end. Well, that's true of internet packets too. And so all the things you know about postcards apply to the internet. But what's interesting about a postcard is it doesn't know how it's being carried and it doesn't know what's written on it. In the case of the internet protocol, the internet packets don't know how they're being carried. They don't care. It could be a satellite link or an optical fiber or a radio channel. And the packets don't know what they're carrying. All they know is it's bits. It's the software at the edges of the net that determine what does this mean, just like you determine what's written on the postcard by using wetware. So this system has accumulated all kinds of new technologies into the underlying transport. And if somebody wanted to invent a new application, they didn't have to get permission from anyone. They didn't have to go to every internet service provider around the world. All those service providers did was move internet packets full of bits. And so if you wanted to invent a new application, you didn't have to get permission. It's permissionless innovation. And that's a big deal because it means if anyone here in the US or in Italy or anyone else in the, anywhere else in the world, if they wanted to build a new application are free to do that. And so invention is the heart of the internet engine. This was designed to scale. When we started this thing, Bob and I said, how many termination points should we account for in the internet? And we uh, went through a little bit of analysis and we said, um, how many networks will there be per country? We just finished building the ARPANET and it was not exactly cheap. So we said, well, maybe there'll be two per country. So there'll be some competition. And then we said, how many countries are there? And we didn't know and there wasn't any Google to ask. So, so we guessed at 128, because that's a power of two and that's how programmers think. So we, and then we said, how many computers per network? And we said, how about 16 million, just to pick a number. So we allowed for 4.3 billion terminations on the original internet design. And that went very well until 2011 when we ran out of the IP version 4, 32-bit address space. Fortunately, the engineers anticipated this. The modern internet protocol is called IP version 6. It has 128 bits of address space. That's enough to uh, reference 3.4 times 10 to the 38th terminations. 340 trillion, trillion, trillion addresses, a number only our Congress could appreciate. <laughs> and so if you want to run, not the experimental internet, which is what you may be running now, but the modern 21st century internet, please ask your internet service provider, when will they be supplying you with IPv6 uh, services? So this system has been open to new protocols, new technologies, and new applications from the beginning, and it's still there. So anyone who says, oh, we're too late, the train has left the station, this is a weird train, we keep making cars to add to the end of the train, so you can jump on a new car whenever it shows up and be part of this environment. So this is what's coming next, the Internet of Things. And I can tell you back in 1973, when Bob and I did the original design, in 1983, when we turned it on, I don't think we were thinking that refrigerators would be part of the internet or uh, picture frames. 
or light bulbs. Oh, I used to tell jokes, someday every light bulb will have its own IPv6 address. I can't tell that joke anymore because Philips and others make light bulbs that have, have IPv6 addresses in them and you can control their color as well as their intensity from applications on your mobile. So now I can't tell, I have to find some new material because that's not a joke anymore. Uh, you can see uh, Sergey uh, Brin wearing the Google Glass first version of this. This was exciting for us because it essentially allowed a computer to become part of your dialogue. It could see what you see and hear what you hear. And if it could understand it, that's, that's not so simple. But if it could, it could be part of the dialogue, kind of like how Star Trek, you remember how they used to say computer and you would hear Rachel Roddenberry's voice floating in from the computer somewhere on the, on the uh, uh, enterprise. So anyway, that was important. And finally, this, this guy in the middle here, this surfboard, this is a guy who invented an internet enabled surfboard. Now, I haven't met him, but I have this image of him sitting on the water, waiting for the next wave, thinking, you know, if I had a laptop in the surfboard, I could be surfing the internet while I'm waiting for the next wave. And so he built a laptop into the surfboard. He put a Wi-Fi service back in the rescue shack, and now he sells this as a product. So if you want to surf the internet while you're out on the water, that's the product for you. Um, now there are new ways to reach the internet. There are gigabit networks that Google has been uh, putting in place in Africa and of course in the US as well, like in Kansas City. We have a, an absolutely crazy project called Loon, which puts balloons at 60,000 feet and deliver internet service from the stratosphere. The balloons are uh, kept in orbit, uh, literally in, at 60,000 feet going all the way around the world at a given latitude. And you can imagine having a bunch of those. We will be uh, starting service in Sri Lanka uh, soon if we haven't already done that. Uh, there is an O3B satellite system, which is in equatorial orbit with 12 satellites. And they're only at 8,000 kilometers. So the delay is like 62 milliseconds. So it's more like continental delay. They can deliver a billion bits per second each to 10 different spot beams anywhere on the planet, 42 degrees north and 40 degrees south. Uh, we also purchased an aerospace company called Titan Aerospace to try to deliver uh, internet service with drones. Uh, we've been repurposing the um, safety channels between the television channels, you know, to keep the televisions from interfering with each other and using those for Wi-Fi or WiMAX communications. And finally, in New York, we decided to repurpose the pay phones because nobody uses them anymore, but they have power and they have connectivity so we can stick Wi-Fi servers in each uh, pay phone and serve the, uh, the consumers that way. So here's another interesting thing. This is how internet is being used for archaeology. This is a picture of uh, the settlements around 350 BC. And they're trying to keep track of what things do, uh, uh, you know, which technologies were discovered in these various places. So internet is becoming a tool for the archeologists that Google is very excited about doing things in Italy and in particular, uh, helping people get online and use the network for commerce. And so uh, with your permission, Ambassador, I'd like to run a short video uh, of that activity. It's assuming I can find it here on my laptop. So where are you? Hello, hello. This is the part where the VP is supposed to know how to do this stuff. And here we go. Mi chiamo Luca Carbonelli, l'azienda è la Torrefazione Carbonelli e si occupa di tutta la produzione e lavorazione del caffè. La Torrefazione Carbonelli si trova a Melito di Napoli, è stata fondata nel 1981 da mio padre Pietro Carbonelli. Attualmente stiamo partecipando al programma del Ministero del Lavoro in collaborazione con Union Camere e Google Crescere in Digitale. Grazie al progetto Crescere in Digitale inseriremo in azienda un tirocinante per sei mesi eh, formato sulle competenze digitali da Google. Mi arrivò una mail del Ministero dicendomi che potevo fare questo corso. Il programma che ho frequentato è stato quello di Crescere in Digitale, un corso che mi ha permesso di ampliare quelle che erano le mie conoscenze sul web, di poterle migliorare, di poterle offrire a qualcuno per poi trovarmi in un laboratorio avendo a che fare con aziende del settore, vere aziende del Made in Italy e affermate su web. Ho scelto di diventare una risorsa per Caffè Carbonelli per un motivo più che ovvio. Qui posso imparare.
penso che questa esperienza possa farmi crescere moltissimo da un punto di vista professionale, proprio perché avrò a che fare con un'azienda che opera nel settore, con dei professionisti. Siamo passati appunto dall'essere analogici al diventare digitali, io dico sempre da passare da una microimpresa ad un'intrapresa. Adesso invece grazie alla visibilità online possiamo acquisire nuovi clienti che vengono loro da noi, da tutto il mondo, però non solo ovviamente dal, dal locale e dal territorio. E abbiamo decuplicato il fatturato, abbiamo acquisito nuovi macchinari, siamo passati da una struttura di 140 metri quadri ad una nuova di 600 metri quadri. Eh, il cambiamento è stato importante e a me piace dire sempre che internet ci ha cambiato la vita. So you know exactly the headline that I want for April 30th, 1986. It's to all of our friends in Italy, wake up and smell the coffee. Thank you. Okay, see you. And it's my pleasure to introduce Cecilia Kang, a technology, New York Times technology uh, reporter, uh, who will have a conversation with our friend Vint, and then we'll open the floor to Q&A with the public. reporting on a merger within the cable internet industry and it shows you there is so much Comcast, oh, excuse me, not Comcast, Charter and Time Warner Cable and it shows... I'm sure Comcast really will figure out how to get in there somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's true. And it just shows that here in the US as well as around the world, um, really enterprise sees the future in broadband and internet. Um, I wanted to start off, you said something very interesting, Vint, about how the internet was initially conceived as open, with permissionless, and anybody could innovate on it. Why then are we not seeing as much, perhaps, enterprise emerge outside of the US? Why is Silicon Valley really the center of some of the biggest, well, all of most of the biggest internet companies? And what is the opportunity for Italy world? Well, the opportunity is there. I mean, the technology is welcoming of new ideas. Uh, so people ask this all, I remember um, uh, uh, Tony Blair asked this question once, how do I turn London into Silicon Valley? And you know, we're all sitting here thinking, how do we answer that? Uh, and it turns out that there is a kind of ecology uh, in the Silicon Valley which contributes to its success. But I think there's more to it than that. Um, in the United States, on the whole, uh, and particularly in Silicon Valley, failure is not fatal. And in other uh, countries and cultures, often failure is considered a permanent mark on your forehead. And so uh, that came out in the conversation that, uh, that we had. Steve Jobs, in fact, was the one that pointed this out to Tony Blair, the thing that we had. This is like over a decade ago. Uh, so that's one thing, failure is not fatal and it's a mark of experience for, uh, for many people in the Silicon Valley. The second thing is that it's really helpful if you have a constant supply of well-educated people, and this is not just engineers. This mm -hmm. is people who know how to do business and finance and you know, sales and marketing and all those other things. And so we have Stanford and Berkeley and uh, you know, UC San Francisco and UC Santa Cruz and other universities in the area, and they're constantly supplying these well-educated kids. And so that helps a lot, but that's not unique. There are other places in the world that can make the same claim. Uh, another thing, of course, is venture capital, and that does seem to be fairly uh, unique to Silicon Valley, but no, we have other places in the, the, uh, the 128 uh, uh, beltway around the Boston area, uh, or Austin, Texas, for example, and other places in New York uh, are showing similar kinds of capacity. And we're starting to see this happening in Europe as well. Google has been trying to encourage that. I mean, we have something called Campus uh, in London, where we bring in a whole bunch of entrepreneurs, four floors worth of them, and then we put some Googlers at the top floor and they are there to consult. So there's a mix of things that have made the Silicon Valley very uh, successful. And I, I wondered at one point, somebody, it was Neely Cruz, uh, asked me about this. And I remember thinking a little bit about it and I, thought, I wonder if it's genetic. 
And what was going through my mind was that, you know, back in the 1850s or so, there was this big migration from Europe to the U.S. because of potato famine and other kinds of things. And of course, even before that, religious persecution brought a lot of people to what became the United States. And I thought, well, maybe what happened is all the people with the genes that were willing to take risk moved to the U.S. And the people that weren't willing to take risks mm -hmm. stayed behind. That's probably not true, but I, it was an interesting theory. So what we need to do, I think, is to reassure people that it is, you know, it's not fatal to fail and it's good to try things out. And if you don't succeed, then you can learn from that. If you keep making the same mistakes over and over again, what's that? That's the Einsteinian definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over. And so I see huge opportunities for our European colleagues and our colleagues in South America and elsewhere to take advantage of the internet technology, which is spreading rapidly in the form of uh, handheld mobiles and smartphones. They are yet another platform on which innovation uh, has been based. And I think that we will see in the remainder of this, certainly this decade, much more uh, around the world, not only in Silicon Valley. And I, I truly hope that happens because this kind of success uh, can be had elsewhere. You can see people coming from places like India into the Silicon Valley and being very successful there because of the ecological uh, environment when they had difficulty in India getting or, or other things. And so there's nothing magic about this, but it does require potentially cultural change and it may even require uh, some legal structure change. And we have this thing called bankruptcy, which it's not a good thing. I went through that when I was at MCI and I don't recommend it to anybody. But the fact is that it allows you to keep a company around, to keep the jobs and to restructure it and go on. And this is not as common in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So these are all kind of nostrums that place. are part of the, of the thing that makes it work. We are also at the same time seeing regulators around the world take very different approaches toward the internet and their views on how the internet should be governed. How is that going to play out, Vint? Do you think that in some ways we're seeing maybe a balkanization of the internet? And if so, what does that mean? Well, um, I, I, I failed to send you the paper I promised to send you on balkanization, which several of us <laughs> wrote for the World Economic Forum. That balkanization comes in a variety of different ways. Some of it's technical. Uh, some people mess around with the domain name system and they, and they cause you to end up in the wrong place. Um, some people do that on purpose and they, you land on a, a malicious website that either asks for your username and password or feeds you malware and infects your computer. Uh, so the balkanization happens because rules are different in different parts of the world and you're constrained to operate one way in one country in a different way. For example, uh, in Europe, the European Court of Justice after hearing a court case from Spain, declared that it was okay, that this right to be forgotten was an important right that they wanted to enforce. And so what that meant for us at Google is that we had to receive hundreds of thousands of requests to, be, um, to have entries in the index of the World Wide Web removed at the request of, uh, of a, uh, an applicant. And so we weren't given very much in the way of uh, guidance about how to decide that. So here we are, a private sector company trying to figure out should we remove this or not. And there are um, con conflicting you know, importances here because think about um, the right of people to know as opposed to the right to be forgotten and what, how do you deal with that? If you're, especially in politics, it may be important for the public to know something that the politician would prefer you didn't know. So this is still, uh, you know, a, 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 an area of considerable uh, debate. There are other things that can happen uh, that create balkanization. Some of it may simply uh, have to do with countries that would like to control the content on the network and what the citizens of the country can see and hear. So uh, we're at Google. Uh, our products and services are interfered with in one way or another with uh, on the order of 40 countries. It might be YouTube that's blocked. It might be all of the Google services in China, for example. Uh, so it, it, the extremes uh, are significant and sometimes it's very episodic. Somebody decides they didn't like a video on YouTube and they shut YouTube down for six weeks. So there's a lot of tension associated with what people are allowed to get access to, what they're allowed to say on the net. And I think that your question uh, implies that there will be a period of time when there is still a struggle 
uh, to decide how the internet should be treated. Its origins were very academic. And even though this was paid for by the Defense Department, the people who did the work were students, graduate students uh, and professors at universities. And you all know that the coin of the realm in academia is information. We don't buy each other's information, we trade information. That's how you make progress. And so the internet's design was built in that environment. And so openness was fundamental to its architecture. And I want to keep it that way if I can, because I think the ability to share information and get access to it is the fastest way to accelerate scientific results business offerings and everything else. Another big point of tension playing out right now in the United States and in other places around the world is this debate over, well, it's being framed as security versus more security, it's encryption. And this was all um, brought, it bubbled up with um, the case between Apple and the Justice Department's FBI and um, the debate over what the role that the government should have and the company should have in giving the government in law enforcement cases access to the phone. This all had to do with encrypted data. And I wonder what your thoughts are on that particular debate as it relates to security going forward. It seems like a really tough question. So I don't think it's as tough as it sounds, uh, but I would like to say that the issue between Apple and the FBI was not about crypto. It had to do with access to the telephone itself. And you know, many of you either use a little pattern or maybe you put in four digits or something uh, in order to unlock your phone. And that phone that was under debate uh, had a uh, four digit uh, pin. And uh, what happened is that uh, the FBI, as I understand it, the FBI uh, tried to uh, reset the password of the uh, owner of that phone. And the side effect of resetting the password wiped out the backup information that was at Apple, which if I've understood correctly, could have been demanded because it wasn't encrypted uh, at Apple. It was encrypted on the phone, but it wasn't encrypted at Apple, except that by the act of uh, changing the password wiped out that piece yeah. of data. So now what happens? Well, the next thing is how do I get access to the phone's data and there was a software that was built into that phone that said, if you try this thing 10 times to, you know, to get the pin in, it will clear itself because it assumes someone has stolen the phone and is trying to break in. And so what the FBI was asking, as I read it, is for Apple to make a piece of software that would disable that feature so they could try as many times as they needed to to break into the phone. As it happens, uh, they apparently found somebody else who found a different way to break yeah. into the phone. So the lawsuit ended. Uh, and uh, the FBI went on to do whatever it did with the information it got on the phone. So to come back now to this crypto thing, that was not about crypto. That was about asking Apple to make a piece of software that could theoretically break every iPhone. And this is like a skeleton key that opens every lock. I am very nervous about anything like that because once such a thing is created and it's digitally signed by Apple so that it would be accepted by an iPhone as a new software load, if that ever got loose in the wrong hands, then every phone is now open. And that ruins everybody's safety and security. So I think Apple took the right position on that. Crypto is a way of protecting information from being exposed. It's a way of protecting confidentiality. It's also a way of, of doing strong authentication so that the phone knows it's you or the, the, your, your uh, account at Google, for example, knows it's you. And I think that's important for everyone to have access to. You should have the ability to protect your privacy. You should have the ability to strongly authenticate yourself. And so this actually contributes to security. Now there will be an argument, which is not unreasonable, that uh, law enforcement, uh, maybe even in national security, has to be able to get access to information under proper conditions. Mm -hmm. And we have laws that deal with that here. Presumably there are laws elsewhere. So although the, the discussion is not fully settled, I think it is not the case that we have to give up all of our safety and security and privacy in order to deal with law enforcement. We have to find a way to make those work together without in, uh, in jeopardizing everyone else. So there. <laughs> so there's, <laughs> you have some agreeers over here. Um, so there's a lot of excitement about the future and artificial intelligence in particular. And there's some fear about artificial intelligence. And you've heard 
folks like Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk and a lot of people sound the alarm that in fact the robots are going to take over the humans. Um, and they were quite serious. And what is yes, your take I, on this? Well, I think that that's sort of out of the fringe. I, I, am, I do not fear that problem. Uh, in fact, I wish that our artificial intelligence would be that good, but frankly, I don't think it is. <laughs> What we see right now at Google is, is the usable things that we call artificial intelligence have, are more like helpers. For example, when you do a Google search, you are actually exercising a substantial amount of artificial intelligence, which we use to parse sentences, to try to figure out the semantics of what you were asking for, try to figure out what uh, information in this gigantic uh, index is, is the best uh, response to your questions. Uh, so I, am, I think people mix up artificial intelligence and robots, for example, I'm actually not as worried about artificial intelligence and robots as much as I am software and robots. Okay? It doesn't matter whether the software is artificially intelligent or not. If there are bugs in the software and some device is operating autonomously with regard to the software, the bugs can cause bad things to happen. But, you know, with Google, we have these, um, uh, massage chairs, and, and Sigrid bought one and put it up in the parlor in our second floor, and I refuse to sit in it because I know that it's run with software, and I'm sure it's going to fold up like that when I'm in it, so I don't, uh, because of some bug. So the big concern I have is not that artificial intelligence is going to be so good that, you know, uh, we will be taken over by the robots, you know, Terminator 3 or something, but rather that we aren't paying enough attention to the fact that the software that we are relying on to do the right thing doesn't always work. And with the Internet of Things coming along, with all these automated processes running, you know, the heating and ventilation and air conditioning in my, in my the cooling system in my wine cellar, uh, which I care a lot about, um, I'm much more concerned about bugs. And I'm concerned that we update software that has bugs in it to fix the bugs. If you can't update the software, you have to live with the bugs, and that's a bad idea. Is it harder to update the Internet of Things? Well, that raises a really interesting question. For the people that do Internet of Things kinds of products, like uh, Nest with our thermostats and our fire alarm systems, we really have to make sure there's a way to update the software. And oh, by the way, we have to make sure that it's legitimate software and not software that's malware. You know, the, the big headline I worry about is 100,000 refrigerators attack Bank of America. <laughs> and, which, by the way, was started by an Italian, in case anybody doesn't remember that. So, so I want to make sure that, that these devices are not abused in that fashion. Mm -hmm. When, Vin, will the whole world be connected to the Internet? Well, it depends on what whole world means. And, and those of you who live here in the United States may have noticed that you know, we were rapidly uh, accreting Internet users until we reached about 80%. And as near as I can tell, 20% of the American population doesn't want to have anything to do with this. You know, they don't want email, they don't want to watch YouTube. But they can't don't want, afford. Uh, well, even in the case where that's not a barrier, they still are not interested. So some people just don't want to have anything to do with this. And I don't know what the demographic is, but I would guess that it's skewed towards folks that are kind of in my age group that would like to just forget about all this. That problem will eventually be resolved. And you know, the people who today are you know, <laughs> online all the time, 24 hours a day, don't watch television because they're too busy watching YouTube, uh, will eventually uh, uh, cause all of the United States to be online and the rest of the world similarly. So my prediction right now, which we will be able to test in a few years' time, is that about 80% of the world's population will indeed be online by 2020, most of them on smartphones. And, and then after that, we may see propagation of fiber and you know, gigabit speed uh, networks at home and in the office. So that's, that's where I think we will be in, in 2020, and maybe it will take till 2030 to get to 100%. And when you think about the globally connected world, the global, the connected world, will the internet provide opportunity to solve really big problems like inequality, poverty? So you know, these are all those, you know, these questions that we all wrestle with all the time. At least I do. Uh, internet is part, potentially part of the solution. When you think about it, uh, 
Improving GDP solves a lot of problems. If you can improve per capita income, it solves a lot of problems. So how do you do that? Well, one answer is that people have to be educated so they can do useful work for which they can uh, be remunerated. And so education comes along. Now, some of you will probably remember the uh, model we had of work uh, in the past. You went to school, you prepared yourself for a career, then you worked for X number of years, and then you retired. This model is no longer going to work. There are two reasons for that. One of them is we live a lot longer. And the second one is that our jobs or the work we can do or the work needed is going to change over time. The implication of that is that we're going to have to learn how to learn new skills uh, over a period of a lifetime. And so I, I know it sounds like uh, uh, just uh, a cliche, but lifelong learning is actually going to be demanded of us. The internet can be part of that solution because it can deliver new teachings and new learnings and new skills to virtually anyone in the world, assuming they have adequate access to the net. So my guess is that um, people who look at innovation and say, you know, the robots are taking over or computers are gonna take all the jobs, uh, sound a little bit like the people who were reacting badly to the first industrial revolution. And indeed, jobs were lost. It's true, it, nobody's trying to sweep this under the rug. On the other hand, a whole bunch of new jobs were created. Now, let me go back to the bugs in the software. Believe me, programmers will be needed forever because no one knows how to write a, a piece of software without a bug. And so we will need programmers to fix the bugs that other people created. Generally speaking, new jobs will come along. The real question is, will the people who lost jobs to automation and other things be able to learn new skills to take on the new jobs that have been created? And that's the thing that we have to make sure we accomplish, which is making sure that people can find new work and, be, uh, and find the uh, ability to learn to do those new things. So we have some time for q and I'm sure a lot of you have some questions for Vin. Can you um, please stand up and maybe introduce yourself as you have a question right there? And there's a microphone being passed around. Thank you so much for your remarks. My name is Anne Lilana. I'm in cybersecurity from a communications perspective, telling people what they should and shouldn't do. So I'd like to go back to your remarks about software through the lens of cybercrime. How do we, or how does the community of programmers and then regulators and government officials, what can they do to reduce the ever expanding world of cybercrime? So uh, let me uh, do, uh, I'll respond in several ways. The first one is that not all the bad things that happen are the result of cybercrime. Sometimes it's actually bugs and mistakes that people make. I mean, some of the worst things that happen in the internet are because somebody configured something wrong. I mean, when, you know, I remember one story where uh, uh, in, in one country, I forget which one now. Oh, no, I do, it was Pakistan. Uh, somebody didn't like what uh, was put up on YouTube, and so the regulators in Pakistan said uh, to the uh, telecom guy, shut down uh, access to YouTube in Pakistan. And, and so they tried to do that, and in effect, they wound up propagating information to the entire internet that shut down YouTube for half of the internet. Of course, everybody noticed that pretty quickly. And we said, what, you know, what are you doing? And they said, oh, sorry, we made a mistake. And I believe them, I think it was really a mistake. So this is not to diminish the question that you're asking. So let's think about this for a minute. First of all, we need to learn how to operate, each of us as, as individuals, how to operate in cyberspace. So we have to know what not to do, like please don't use passwords that read password because it's easy to remember. Uh, or some other guy decided to use incorrect as his password. So if he typed the wrong thing, the message would say your password is incorrect. And, you know, so I, you know, Brilliant. So, um, so, so we have to learn not to just rely on usernames and passwords. At Google, we have what's called two-factor authentication, and we offer this freely to everybody. It could be an algorithm that you run in your mobile. It could be a little chip that you put into the USB port. But this idea is something you know and something you have that the other guy doesn't have to keep them from getting into your accounts. The same thing is true for using cryptography. We use it all the time at Google to protect people's information. Information is transferred in cryptographic form. It's at rest. It's encrypted. 
people need to know about that, need to ask questions about that and get transparent answers to that. We need to teach kids how to be safe in cyberspace. And uh, this is you know, just like you tell them, watch, you know, look both ways before you cross the street and don't, in, don't get into cars with strangers. We need to teach kids how to be safe in the cyber world, how to be suspicious of messages that show up that you don't really know what they're from. Phishing attacks are now one of the most popular and effective ways of getting into somebody's account. In fact, the one that I heard most recently was a letter that was an email. It was spoofed from the CEO of the company to the employees. And in one case, I was told it was a message from a false message from the CEO to an employee in the um, accounts department saying transfer $20 million to this account. And they did. And you know, the, the first thing you're supposed to do when somebody asks you to do that is to go double check and find out, did you really send this message? And do you really want me to do that? Those of you who get messages saying, help, help, uh, I've lost my passport and I've been beaten up and you know, someplace other than Italy, because uh, that would never happen in Italy. Uh, you know, it, you should think twice before you believe that message. And you might even send a note back to the person it appears to have come from saying, did you actually send this? And most of the time the answer is no, unless of course it came from Nigeria, in which case. <laughs> it was intentional. So, I mean, I don't need to be, uh, to be silly about this because the fact is we do have to learn how to be safe in cyberspace and we have to know how to protect ourselves now i need if any of you are programmers are going to hate what i'm about to say because it's my belief that programmers and i used to be one i made my living writing software when i was at ibm um, i think programmers have gotten away with murder for 70 years ever since the invention of computers they have not been held accountable for the mistakes in their software and if those mistakes cause a lot of trouble it seems to me that there should be more accountability. Now, there may be various ways for this to happen. If you're a mechanical engineer or civil engineer, there are certain projects for which you must be licensed before you can lead that project. If you're gonna build a bridge or a 100-story building, if you don't have a license, you're not gonna do that job. So at least that's true here in the US. So programmers hate the idea of being licensed but I think we need to find ways of, of introducing accountability. Another possibility is, you uh, I'm sure you're aware of this, cyber insurance is starting to pop up. And you know, the, the, perhaps the good thing about cyber insurance is if a company buys the insurance, it may be thinking there may be financial consequences of a serious failure uh, in my company and I'm trying to protect uh, the company's financial resources. It's, however, not the case that by getting cyber insurance, you protect against the mistakes. The mistakes are still gonna happen. And so you have to find another way to deal with that. Accountability is one of them. And to be honest, uh, my programming colleagues and I keep saying, we need to build, here's a, here's a role for artificial intelligence, which I hope you'd all agree would be a good thing. I want the computer to figuratively sit on my shoulder. And while I'm writing the software, I can say to it, are there any buffer overflow problems in my software? And it looks at me and it says, yes. And it said, well, where are they? It says, well, they're down there. Uh, or I can ask it other questions and have it say, I can't es establish uh, that there's uh, any problem of, you know, uh, a piece of code that uses the value of a cell in the memory that hasn't been initiated. There, these are common mistakes that programmers make and they cause potentially a lot of trouble. So I want artificially intelligence, intelligent software to help me as an assistant mm -hmm. to make the software be less likely to be buggy. So those are all bits and pieces of, yeah, she, is she allows us- We should to, get another call. Okay, well, we'll, we'll yeah. come back around. <laughs> Yes, sir. Oh, this one here, one, yes. two, right? Okay, you're number one, yeah, you with the long hair, right? And you're next. Okay, here comes the microphone. Yeah, Jerry Glenn, Millennium Project. Hi. And give us some prognosis about malware. I mean, there's a lot of different potentials, in it. Are, are, is it an unending intellectual arms race? Will we ever be safe? Yeah, so uh, it's pretty clear there's a lot of malware out there and there are defenses against this. Uh, among the best defenses uh, against malware uh, are uh, two things. One is, is using digital signatures so that someone can't send you a piece of code that hasn't at least been um, validated by the apparent source. Now, I wanna be careful because you obviously know that certificate authorities have been compromised 
they've issued certificates that look like they came from Microsoft and Google or others. And so uh, there are a whole series of mechanisms beyond the certificate authority mechanism in order to um, assure that the crypto keys that are being used to validate the software have not been compromised. So that's one very simple example of things that you can do to avoid ingesting uh, bad code. Even if the code is accurately uh, ascribed to the source, it could still have a bug in it. That's a different problem. Uh, there are other things that we can do. Uh, for example, in the case of browsers, when the, when the World Wide Web was first designed by Tim Berners-Lee, the browser was basically a formatting engine. The hypertext um, markup language was mostly saying, here's how you lay out this text and images. Here's the font size and the color and all that. It was basically a rendering engine. And so it was pretty innocuous. Well, fast forward uh, from 1993 or so to the present, now what's in the, the code that your browser loads, there's JavaScript and there's Java and there's Python and there are other high level languages and there's HTML5. This is programming language stuff. Your browser is like an operating system executing code. And if the code says, well, I'm going to store some extra software in the middle of your operating system, now you're in trouble. So we have ideas at Google, which we've implemented like sandboxes, which basically say, okay, if we're going to execute this software from this web page, which I just loaded into the browser, I'm going to build the, the um, environment in which that software is executed so that it's isolated from everything else in the computer and all the other processes that are running on that machine, whether it's a laptop or your mobile or something else. And so these are techniques for isolating our uh, vulnerability to malware. Nothing is perfect, but we have to keep doing things like that. And it is a missile, anti-missile kind of thing. And, you know, it, there will always be somebody who wants to cause trouble. Yes, sir. Uh, here comes the microphone again. Hi, Jim Hoagland, Washington Post. Um, Hi, Jim. I wanted to ask you a question about something you very artfully left implicit rather than saying directly. Okay. You gave the impression, at least to this uh, listener, and I want to thank you for remarks that are as uh, invigorating as they are accessible. You left me with the impression that Italy deserves to be labeled an early adapter of the internet. Have you ever been able to identify the characteristics, and I believe in national character, that would have made Italy an early adapter? So that's a really interesting question. Um, I think uh, what actually, historically what has happened is that the uh, research and academic community leapt on the idea in the 1970s, recognizing along with a number of us that this was powerful technology and they contributed to it and explored it. Then there was a sort of a delay. They went off in the OSI space for a while, which was not working very well uh, and eventually adopted internet. There was a relatively slow penetration of internet in Italy for quite a long time. And I'm not sure that I understand all of the reasons for that, uh, but it may have to do with what infrastructure was available. It might have had to do with the cost uh, and economics of access to internet. Uh, but until the um, smartphone showed up, the Italian penetration was probably on the lower end of the scale in Europe some countries in Europe were 80% penetrated, especially up in uh, the north, in the Scandinavian countries. As you went further south, uh, Italy, Greece, Spain, and so on, tended to be less uh, well uh, penetrated, 50, 60% sometimes. We did speculate a little bit about that and wondered whether the reason that the Scandinavian countries were penetrated so quickly is that during those long winter nights, there's nothing else to do except surf the internet. So. You know, they, they went after it sooner than everybody else did. Uh, what we see now, though, uh, as we celebrate this 30th anniversary, is a significant appetite in Italy uh, to make use of the Internet. And I attribute much of this to the presence of smartphones and the uh, ease with which uh, people can get access to that capability. We're seeing this true elsewhere in the world as well. The first experience that many people have around the world will be a smartphone getting access to the Internet. And then eventually uh, they may uh, also get other devices. The Internet of Things will contribute to that. And of course, laptops and pads and other sorts of things as well. 
But I think there was a, a kind of a, um, a slow uh, access all across Southern Europe. Uh, and now we're seeing everybody starting to catch up again. Another question right here? We have a phone, uh, microphone, microphone right coming behind, in you. behind you. Thank you very much, Joanna Brignolo. I am curious, it's just a far-fetched uh, question perhaps, uh, but you can answer. Will there ever be a point where we will be, reach a saturation level? Well, I, you know, of course, as the chief internet evangelist, I hope that comes sooner rather than later. Uh, and so when you say saturation, that the implication of that is either everybody has it or, not, or no one wants any more of it. The answer is I don't know. And the reason I'm not sure is that the next swath of penetration is this Internet of Things. And we're talking 20, 30, 50 billion devices. If we go out to 2036, I estimate between 90 and 100 billion devices will be on the Internet. And the reason is there are so many is that per person, there could be as many as 100. And you might say, well, how could that be? Well, if every single light bulb in your house and light switch and, you know, appliance and instrumentation, keeping track of your health and vital signs and everything else, it doesn't take long to add up to a lot of devices. And I will uh, ask you, just as an exercise, when you go home, figure out how many devices around the house are actually online devices. And you may find three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 already. And especially people who have multiple laptops and they have television sets uh, that are internet enabled and uh, they have mobiles and everything else. So I don't think that we will see saturation along those lines for a while, probably not until 2030, 2035. But then the next thing may happen. And that's these devices that are nanoscale devices that are molecular devices. And now we're talking about things that are so small we can't even see them. And yet they may very well function as devices that can be part of a network. And so at that point, my imagination starts to weaken. And I, you know, I'm not quite sure what to say. But I've already seen examples of things that you can swallow that go through your body, doing all kinds of analysis, and then transmitting data to say what it found before it exits. Uh, and you can see other people who are experimenting with vascular uh, devices that literally are small enough to go into the vascular system and make at least identify places where repairs are needed. Uh, devices like insulin pumps, which today are kind of big and clumsy, but eventually may become quite tiny. So in the 2030s, we may see a, a new um, wave of devices that are still communicating and still networked, but are on the molecular scale. And at that point, you know, there could be an uncountable number of these things. We've got one last question. How about over back there with the, uh, the gentleman with his hand up? Yes. Thank you. Thanks very much for your remarks. My name is Samir Vazda from the World Bank. I wonder if you could share any impressions, and Cecilia, welcome to join as well, um, about zero rating um, and what the kind of pros and cons, and if you would, where you stand on that. Thanks. So uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, zero rating, uh, at least in some contexts, means that an internet service provider that has decided to apply caps on how much data you're allowed to transmit through their system, their internet service in a month, uh, will not apply the cap to some product or some service. And some people argue that uh, if this is um, done um, by making some kind of a special deal with one company who's offering a service and, and to uh, reduce their, and to remove the barrier of use by a uh, consumer. If that deal is done by the supplier of the internet service, that's no longer the consumer's choice. That's a deal that the uh, internet service provider has chosen. And so some people say, well, that's not right. What we should be doing is uh, either not having caps at all or we should let the consumers decide whether they want to apply a zero rating uh, and maybe let them choose among different services that get zero rated if the ISP is in fact interested in providing this preferential uh, service. The jury's out on this because we're seeing in different countries uh, different decisions. In, Indi in India, for example, there was a decision that zero rating was an unacceptable violation of what they consider network neutrality. And so, and here in the United States, of course, uh, our FCC has a set of rules 
for uh, network uh, internet operation and for which this particular kind of service may, uh, may be a violation. So at this point, there's a lot of debate. My view right now is that the most important thing we can do is to maximize choice for users to choose among service providers, to choose the services and products that they want to get access to uh, on, on equal terms for everybody. Every user should have the same kind of choices that everybody else gets. And as long as we can make that happen, I think we're in a much better position. I would love it if there was more competition uh, among service providers. In the absence of that, you sometimes find regulators uh, concerned about user choice and users being uh, in some in some sense abused by uh, business practices that might be considered anti-competitive. So uh, we're going to work our way through this. This is like almost everything else in the internet. We can't really predict the new products and services and facilities that will be invented. And so we literally are going to have to live through these various situations and try to figure out the best way to maximize utility, especially for the consumers who make use of the system. So I guess that's all the time we got. We do have, that is all the time we have. Thank you so much to Vidsur, inventor of the internet for, thank you. you covered a ton of territory. And thank you all for coming.